today we are going to continue our two-part series in the reliability of the scriptures. Last week we covered the Dead Sea Scrolls and we highlighted how they matter to us. Namely, they gave us that wonderful transmission chain from about 600 BC all the way through into our modern time, an unbroken chain of reliable transmission. Knowing that we have the Old Testament that we were given by the Lord, right from the hand of Isaiah and Jeremiah and Daniel. But this week, we're going to focus on the New Testament. So our topic today is the top 10 reasons the New Testament is reliable. Have you ever asked yourself, is my Bible trustworthy? Is the New Testament You know, the 27 books that were given to us in the New Testament, they went through a copying process, and they also make statements that claim to be historical. So today we're going to address two very important questions. One, can we trust the historical statements in the scriptures of the New Testament? And two, was the New Testament accurately copied and transmitted down to us today so we can be guaranteed that... The New Testament is trustworthy. You can take it to the bank. You can believe that these are the actual words of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Paul, and the others. So let's go ahead and take a look. In fact, the picture that you see right now on your screen is a fragment, a manuscript, a Greek manuscript of 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and part of chapter 12, part of the Chester Beatty Papyrus Collection. And those manuscripts will definitely be a part of our explanation today. So our first scripture we're going to look at is to show you that the writers of the New Testament were writing down eyewitness history. They were writing down what they saw, what they heard with Jesus, and so forth. In fact, Luke 1, verses 1 through 4 says, "...inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. So Luke, the great physician, now writes a letter back to Theophilus, perhaps uh, Luke's friend or even owner. Perhaps Luke was, was a slave, a medical doctor. We say that because he uses a lot of medical terminology. And he uses one of those medical terms right here in this passage. The word here for eyewitness is autoptes, autopte. And that word is actually where you and I get our English word autopsy from. And what he's saying here is that he collected or collated and investigated as a journalist, so to speak, all the things that Jesus began to do and to teach. And he wanted to make sure Theophilus had an accurate and orderly account of this. So he uses this great word that suggests that these eyewitnesses and what Luke was doing was looking into the details of the matter just as a coroner would look into the cause of death for somebody. You look at the details, you take the vitals, you you take skin tissues, and you look at the organs to determine these things, and that's what Luke did. He wasn't somebody to slough off his investigation into the truthfulness of the historicity of what he learned in those people he investigated. But it doesn't stop there. It goes on to 1 John 1, 1 through 4. Notice what John the Apostle says. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you, that your joy may be full. Now, notice the times he uses, we have declared this to you. This has been manifested to us. We have seen, we have handled, we have heard. These are an assault on the five senses that we have. Our eyes, our taste, our touch, our hearing, our smell, and so forth. 
All this comes to bear on recording the very words of Jesus. His actions, his teachings, all the things that he did, the disciples were keenly aware that this was rooted in actual history. It was rooted in the real world, in time-space events. It wasn't an ethereal gospel. It wasn't an ethereal record. It wasn't a theoretical idea that came to us. It was a real person grounded in reality. He walked real paths. He climbed real mountains. He traversed real deserts and real valleys. All these things are something that is rooted in reality. And thank God for us because our doctrines flow out of that reality. You see, you believe in the historic Christian faith. You believe in a faith rooted in history. It's rooted in the ground. It's not floating in theoretical philosophy. It's not floating in the ideas of some man. It is rooted in the actual time-space world. And thank God for archaeology. It confirms many of the things that we describe in the scriptures. Now, 2 Peter 1.16 affirms to us that we followed real history based on eyewitnesses. Notice what he says. For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So notice Peter makes the distinction between the mythos. He uses the word mythos there for fables. We weren't following the legends of Mesopotamia, whether it was, you know, the Isis or Cyrus or Tammuz. No, we're following the real incarnated Christ, our Lord, that had flesh and bone that walked this earth before us. And then finally, notice 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16. Peter goes on to talk about the problems people have when they read the New Testament, especially uh, Paul's epistles. He says, Our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which some are hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of of Scripture. So notice Peter, he's confirming that Paul's epistles, his letters, are actually Scripture. Notice it says, as they do the rest of Scripture. So that means that Paul's epistles are rooted and grounded in that body of literature called the Scriptures that we have before us today. But the sad part about that is some people look at the New Testament, and especially Paul's letters, and they deviate. They say, oh, this is just legend and myth. This is just a fable that was concocted by the fertile imagination of a Jewish mind. You know, they've been writing these things for centuries, and the New Testament is no different. In fact, today, notice what the critics are saying. The critics are saying this. Now, there's seven items here that you should see. First of all, Dr. Bart Ehrman says the Bible has errors. He is the protege of Bruce Metzger, who was the Princeton scholar for New Testament manuscripts. Bart Ehrman has written all kinds of different books, and he believes that there are errors in the New Testament. Also, you have the Bible cannot be trusted. That's the Jesus Seminar. They're a liberal think tank up in Northern California who concluded that only 2% of the words in red in your Gospels Jesus actually spoke. 98% Jesus did not speak or probably did not speak. Also, you have the Bible was written by men. This is humanism. That's the mantra you have today in the public education system or the garden variety pagan who was out on the street when you tried to witness the gospel to them. Oh, it was just written by men. And the implication is men make mistakes. You know, human beings error. It's inevitable and so forth. And certainly, we're not perfect. Yes, we do make mistakes. But the problem that humanism has is they forget that humans don't always make mistakes. You could go home and write an inerrant paper, a one-page paper today, and it can be considered inerrant. It's not the Word of God, obviously, but it certainly doesn't have to have mistakes. Humans err sometimes, not all the time. Also, George Frazier, he wrote the book The Golden Bough, and said the Bible, both Old Testament and New, is a product of legend. 
And he says it's no different than the legendary myth accounts that we find in the academic world that talk about the various um, different issues within the Old Testament as well. But unfortunately, Fraser's work was discredited, uh, fortunately, uh, in the 20th century. And there is no basis now to assume that the Bible was based on Mesopotamian myth. The connection is just not there. In fact, the Bible is more simple and believable than Old Testament, what they call Old Testament myth or Mesopotamian myth. You see, the Mesopotamian myth had all kinds of outrageous statements. They weren't simple and believable like you have in the Old Testament. And there's one thing about myth, especially according to the greatest myth writer probably who ever lived, C.S. Lewis. He said, the Bible does not reflect the characteristics of myth or fable or legend because myth always gets more outrageous over time. It gets the fish that's this big in the myth. In 2,000 years, it's this big, right? You've heard the story. You share one story, and it just starts to get expanded and extrapolated. Well, that's how myth grows. It grows in its content and outrageousness. But the Bible, if it was based on an outrageous myth, and this was the latest myth written, it should be even more outrageous than the earlier myths. But what we're finding is exactly the opposite. That Moses, when he writes about the Pentateuch, the first five books in the Bible, and he talks about the parting of the Red Sea or the feeding of God with manna and so forth, these are all things that are believable. These are things that are more simple, not outrageous like pulling a rabbit out of a hat. So Mr. Fraser's golden bough was discredited quite a bit because people know the direction of myth and the Bible does not follow that direction. Notice number five here. The Bible is historically inaccurate. Israel Finkelstein, an archaeologist who digs throughout the Middle East, especially in Israel, says the Old Testament wasn't even started to be written until about 700 B.C. It says that the Bible was written very late, very late, because what is the problem there is if the Bible was written very late, then you remove it from any eyewitness accounts. So notice that the liberal scholars, what they'll do is continue to move the Gospels and the Old Testament further away from the time of the actual events because they want to dismiss the eyewitness primary source, firsthand accounts of all of these records. And unfortunately, Finkelstein is followed by a considerable following. Also, the Bible's manuscripts are corrupt according to Islam. Islam says that the manuscripts used to, to reconstruct your English Bible have been corrupted over time. But the problem is they can't prove it because the same manuscripts that were in existence in the first century, the second century, the third century, all the way through up through the late Middle Ages are all matching. There is no wide deviation between the manuscripts. They all are on the same voice, the same page, and they say essentially the same thing with the exception of little scribal spelling mistakes and so forth, those minor variants. And then you have the Bible contains some legend. Even today within the Christian church, these neo-evangelicals they're called, they have now said that the Gospels contain small bits of legendary fragments that are in there that actually were not written by the author. And you would be surprised about who's endorsing all these different things. So, yes, you know, 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16, people do twist, people do attack scripture. Um, but let's go through the four crucial characteristics of the Bible. These will help us get to our 10 points. Notice four crucial characteristics that are present for any biblical revelation. First of all, we start with the assumption that God cannot err. Mm -hmm. Titus 1-2 says God cannot lie. Yeah. You and I can lie, you and I can make mistakes, but God cannot err. Amen. Also, too, if God cannot err, and this is the word of God, then God breathed out the scriptures according to 2 Timothy 2, 3, 16. It says all scripture is inspired. It's breathed out by God. And that's that Greek term theopneustos. 
It means God breathed. He, it's his breath. It's his mind. He is the one behind the scriptures, even though humans penned the scriptures. Amen. That results in an inerrant text. If God, who cannot make mistakes or lie, breathes out the scriptures, the text thereby must be inerrant. It must be without mistake. In John 17, 17, Jesus said there are no errors in the scripture. He said, your word is truth. In, it's an infallible test. If it's breathed out by God who cannot err, and that means it's an inerrant text, then that means the scripture cannot fail. They cannot be broken. They're infallible. He said the scriptures cannot be broken in John 10, 35. So wrap up all these into a clear, precise logic. What is it? It's very clear. Since God cannot err, and the Bible is the word of God, therefore the Bible cannot err. The logic is tight. The inspiration of the word is here, and the inerrancy of the word is here. You see, the inerrancy of the word is directly tied to God's nature. So God is inerrant, so our word is inerrant. Yes, we can make interpretive mistakes, as we often do, but the word of God itself cannot be in error in anything it implies, teaches, or anything else. Now, let's go through those top 10 reasons. Now, reason number one, why your New Testament can be trusted and is reliable. Jesus said the Bible can be trusted. Remember, if somebody rises from the dead and demonstrates it, he has instant credibility with me. <laughs> Hopefully with you too. So that's why I say Jesus is a source for reliability. Whatever Jesus who is God teaches is true. He resurrected from the dead and the miracles confirm his statement as true that thy word is truth in John 17, 17. Jesus confirmed the Old Testament and promised the New Testament. He said the Holy Spirit would lead you into all truth. Also, the accurate testimony of Jesus John 5.36 says the testimony or the scriptures all speak of him. They're all about him, both Old and New Testament. In their own unique ways, they're all pointing to Jesus. Notice what Jesus said about the New Testament. He said it's divinely inspired, reliable and historical. It's indestructible, inerrant. It's unified. That means one author, though many writers. Unity. It has scientific accuracy long before its years. And notice it's the final word. Remember that little phrase, it is written? It is written. It is written. Matthew chapter 4, three times he uses that phrase in a row. And what that means is that this book is the final criteria for all faith and practice. It is the final document by which everything else must correspond to, whether it's through behavior or not. It is written, the finality of the word. Reason number two, the quantity of New Testament manuscripts are more than adequate to reconstruct the originals. The quantity, the sheer numbers of these New Testament manuscripts are such that we have so many manuscripts, we don't know what to do with them all. They are spread out all over the world and throughout the United States, North America, and so forth that we have so many Greek manuscripts, it is just amazing. And why is the quantity so important? Well, it's important because the more manuscripts you have, the more cross-referencing you can do, and scholars can piece together the original based on these manuscripts that come from different geographical areas and different scribal groups or in different monks. And to make sure, it's like a check and balance. And what we find is, is that the Bible is on the same page. No matter which Bible you pick up, it's all talking about the same thing. Yes, there's little changes of verb and subject and direct objects and stuff, you know, for, for making the Bible read smoothly. But the content and the meaning is the same. We have the most manuscripts. Now, the quantity of the New Testament manuscripts, reason number two still, next slide, quantity of the New Testament manuscripts are more than adequate to reconstruct the originals. Now, firstly, it's the most numerous supported by manuscript work from ancient history. There is ancient history starts about 300 AD and it goes backwards into the BC times. This is your number one document in all the world that's supported 
by the most manuscripts. Not anything else exceeds the New Testament. It is number one, whether you're studying it at Harvard or the Cal State or the UC system or in a church, it has that status as number one. Secondly, there are over 5,800 Greek manuscripts alone used to reproduce the New Testament. 5,800 over, and it's growing daily. It just more just are being discovered, more are being found, and they're adding to that copies. The Greek copies are the earliest copies, usually, and some into the Middle Ages as well. Notice 19,000 manuscripts of the New Testament are written in various language, like Coptic or Syriac or German or whatever it might be. There are 19,000. So you put all these together, there are well over 24,000, 25,000 documents to support the reconstruction of the New Testament. In fact, the church father quotes could reconstruct most of the New Testament if we lost all of these manuscripts. Just go to their writings. And you start picking all these verses in the, the church father's quotes, and you find that you can reconstruct nearly everything. Now let's move on to reason number three. The early dates of the manuscript. Now this little manuscript here is only about four inches tall, and it's called the John Ryland's Fragment. It's called P52 for the scholars, Papyrus 52nd Piece Cataloged. And it dates to about A.D. 117 to 135. And it's a fragment of John chapter 18. It's written on the front. It's written on the back. And lo and behold, when you read it in Greek, it says, Pilate asked, what is truth? This is the oldest New Testament manuscript we have. And notice the Gospel of John was probably written sometime in the last decade of the first century, maybe 95, 96 A.D., and this can date as early as 117. We're talking only about 30 to 35 years removed from the original document. This is so close, and every word on this document is exactly what we're finding in our English Bible. Everything measured up to the accurate transmission. It's just amazing. And this is just one little early fragment, and there are thousands more. Notice reason number three, still. Look at this chart and see that the New Testament manuscripts, as they are compared with other ancient sources. Now, the print might be a little bit small for you, but just know on the far left-hand column, you have the author, like Plato, Homer, Herodotus, Aristotle, Thucydides, Aristophanes, Sosceles, Julius Caesar, Tacitus, the Roman historian, Pliny the Younger, Suetonius, their works are in the next column, but then when you get to the far right column, notice that all these works have a small amount of manuscripts to reconstruct their original document. But you go down to the bottom of that right column, notice there's 25,000 plus manuscripts to reconstruct the New Testament. Wow. So when you look at these philosophers and historians of ancient history, we're talking 20 for Plato, 8 for Herodotus, 5 for Aristotle, 8 for Thucydides, 10 for Aristophanes. You, these small numbers compared to 25,000, now you know why you can be confident that you're reading the original document that came from the hands of the writers themselves. Reason number four. Reason number four. The New Testament is most accurately copied work of ancient history. Not only does it have the most manuscripts, not only does it have the early dates, in fact, the early dates are so very important, but it's the most accurately copied work. Your distant second place is Homer's Iliad. Homer's Iliad has 1,800 copies plus, whereas the Greek New Testament, just the Greek language manuscripts are 5,800 plus. There's a 350-year gap for Homer's Iliad between the original writing and the first copy that we have. 350 years in between that gap. Whereas the New Testament is 30 to 300 years. It's a very tight gap because the tighter the gap between the original and your copy, the more reliable the transmission you can argue because what happens in between all that time between the copy, because the originals are gone, they're lost to time. 
So you're going to have to ask, how good are our copies, how early are our copies, and how accurately copied are our copies? So notice that Homer's Iliad is 95% accurate in their copying by the scribes, whereas the New Testament is 99.5% plus, depends who you ask in the scholarly world, percent accuracy. Again, slips of the pen and so forth through scribes account for that extra little bit. So we're the most accurately copied New Testament. Reason number four, the New Testament is not only the most accurately copied, but it's that according to the scholars. Bruce Metzger of Princeton, the late Bruce Metzger, I should say, the Bible is 99.5% accurate, whereas the Mahabharata, that's the Hindu uh, scriptures, 90% accurate. Homer's Iliad, 95% accurate. Westcott and Hort Bible scholars say that the Bible is 98.33% accurate in the New Testament. John Wenham says the New Testament is 99.8% accurate in its copying. Ezra Abbott, 99.75%. And A.T. Robertson, the great Greek scholar, says 99.9% accurate in the copying process. That should give you great confidence in the New Testament. Let's move on to reason number five. The fact that the New Testament has counterproductive features shows us that we can trust the New Testament in its transmission and its historical statements. Counterproductive features are features that we wouldn't expect to be in a document because they show some bad side of the people who are writing the document. If people were trying to lie, they would make themselves look great. They would leave out Peter's denial of the Lord three times. You know, they would leave out Peter's hypocrisy in, in meeting with the Jews and the Gentiles. Paul had to confront him and rebuke him on that issue. The dim-witted, slow approach of the 12 apostles, they were slow in understanding, or the ignominious, shameful death of the Messiah himself. These are all counterproductive features you wouldn't otherwise find in a document that would purport to be truth. In fact, historians say that these features tell you that the document is truth because anybody trying to lie would certainly expunge all those things. Notice the testimony of women first. They were the first evangelists despite women not having full rights in the first century. They were not to be believed. They can only testify in certain court matters, not in every court matter. And yet we see Mary being the first evangelist, the first one sharing the gospel. If you wanted to pull the wool over somebody's eyes in the New Testament, you certainly would not appear to a woman first and have her go out and spread the message. But yet, that's what we find in the New Testament. Secondly, the apparent triumph of Christ's enemies. You know, here Jesus is dying, exposed for all to see, being beaten. He said he was the king of kings, he was the Messiah, and now he's hanging on a cross. That doesn't seem to be consistent with the message, but yet it's still in there. It shows the weakness of the Messiah, so to speak. The helpless and weak appearance of Christ at death and also the disciples, number four, are fearful. They're hiding for fear of the Jews. They thought they would be next. They would be crucified. So they're in hiding and, and laying low, keeping a low profile. But yet that's what we find in the text. And then fifth, the extreme failure and denial of the disciples. Even one of them from inside the 12 ends up betraying Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, Judas. And then we have Peter denying the Lord and so forth. But yet it's all recorded as truth in the scriptures. The dim-witted and slow understanding of those closest to Jesus. After he rose from the dead, they still didn't understand what he meant about being delivered over to sinful men, being killed, buried, and rising the third day. They still didn't know. The angel had to point them back to Luke 9.22 that said, do you not remember what he said? <laughs> you weren't paying attention in class, guys. <laughs> and, you know, so we have all these things that are counterproductive, and that is a mark and a feature of reliability of a historical document. Notice reason number six. The New Testament testifies on its own behalf. Notice 
The Bible is innocent until proven guilty. It's not guilty till proven innocent. The axiom is innocent till proven guilty. If you inverted that axiom and you made things guilty until proven innocent, you would be going shopping and opening all the beans, opening all the cereals, tasting them, verifying that what's in the can and what's on the label is telling you the truth. Okay, that's what happens when you invert this axiom. Nobody here lives like that. We all assume the red light is telling us the truth. We all assume that the markings on the restroom are telling us the truth. Men, women, okay? Now I think it's what, non-binary or whatever you have on the, on the right. But we approach life, reading signs and approaching things as innocent until proven guilty. There's no need to be suspicious about this book unless it gives you a reason to be suspicious. That's what all historians approach ancient documents with, innocent till proven guilty. Notice the Bible lacks a mythological tone. It testifies on its own behalf. Now, if I were to read you Luke chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, about all the kings that are mentioned, the geographical territory, the date and all this, it doesn't read like myth, guys it makes it very clear that it's talking about real time, space, historical people. In fact, the Bible is historically accurate, point three here. Also for the eyewitnesses to the events of Scripture. Luke uses that great turn autopti for eyewitnesses. And then fifth, Luke's precise use of vocabulary in the book of Acts is impeccable. The book of Acts was criticized by liberal scholars for decades until archaeology showed on this next slide here, you can see that Luke has used the correct and precise language for the time in which he wrote. He used the correct language for spoken at Lystra as Lyconian in Acts 14.11. He used the proper form of the name Troas in Acts 16.8. He used the proper designation of polytarchs for magistrates ruling Thessalonica in Acts 17.6. The correct Athenian, Athenian, Greece, slang word for Paul as spermologos, or seed picker, in Acts 17.18. He uses Areopagites as a proper title for the members of the Athenian court on Mars Hill in Acts 17.34. Luke also used the proper title, grammatus, for chief magistrate, of those who are in Ephesus in Acts 19.35. Notice the next slide. The correct Roman title of honor was Neocoros. He used even that precise term and rare term. He used the plural anthropotoi referring to two men functioning as proconsuls at the same time. So there were two governors of an area in Acts 19.38 and he used the exact correct designation for that. While he was on the ship, notice what Luke uses during the book of Acts on chapter 27, verse 28. He uses the precise term for taking depth soundings as they approached the shallow shore of Malta. They called it balasantes. And it's still, in fact, many archaeologists have gone out to where the two seas meet near Malta and measured the depth, and the depth is about the same as the Bible records back in the first century. Very chilling. And then finally, Luke uses the correct term for the ruler of Malta. He called him the first man of the island. In the Greek, it's protos tes nesu. It was that inscription they found on Malta, and Paul uses the very title they would appropriate to their leader. Just as president or vice president would be in the United States, that he uses the exact correct title for this man. What you read about in Scripture is certainly trustworthy. Now we go on, and notice what Sir William Ramsey says about Luke the historian after reading the book of Acts. The Bible testifies on its own behalf, certainly. Notice what he says. He says, without error, Luke records... 32 countries, 54 cities, 9 islands, and 12 confirmed ruling figures in just Luke chapters 1 through 3 alone. Luke was an extraordinary person to write the history of the spread of the gospel in the early church. You can take to the bank, you can be confident knowing that Luke wrote the truth. In fact, many 
scholars had to revise their books or just burn them all together might be a better idea, um, to change these things when archaeology uh, was digging up and they found what the real story was, they ultimately had to change and edit their books. Updated version. But the book of Acts has stayed the same this entire 2,000 years. Why? Because he got it right. He got it right. Let's look at reason number seven now. The Bible is scientifically accurate. Notice that the earth free floats in space, according to Job 26, 7, well before we sent man to the moon. The earth is circular. It's an orb, in other words, in Isaiah 40, 22. There's an incalculable number of stars, according to Jeremiah 33, 22. And that's what we're finding in science today. Accurate comparison between number of sand grains on the seashore to the number of stars in the heavens. You know, it's about the same ratio. You ever count all the little grains of sand on the seashore? Oh, my word. That would be tedious. The universe is expanding according to Isaiah 42.5, and Hubble's telescope back in the early 20th century said the galaxies are shifting further and further apart, telling you that it's still growing today. And also, the usable energy is wearing out. That's what you scientists call entropy. Things that were ordered are now going to disorder. It's like a dilapidated barn falling apart over time. Things wear out. According to Psalm 102, that's exactly what the universe is doing. It's wearing out like an old garment, it says. And then finally, creation multiplies according to its kind. You don't see orange trees producing bananas. You don't see alligators giving birth to hippopotamuses. You don't see humans giving birth to tricycles or any other animal except human beings. It's because God made us to reproduce after our own kind, ahead of time, ahead of the scientists understanding this. Now, also the universe had a beginning. It goes on and says that Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. That's exactly what scientists have found when they send their, their explorers out to space, that the universe had a beginning. And notice that God has created all mankind from one genetic ancestor, according to Acts 17.26. Paul said, from one blood, you all came. In other words, everybody knows now that in science that there is an Adam and Eve gene. They call it the Adam and Eve gene. They actually call it that because they now know that we all came and descended from a common parent. And that's exactly what the scriptures say. God intelligently designed the universe. Psalm 19. We should glorify him because his works just show us the kind of God he is. He's intelligent. He's powerful. He's benevolent. He's kind and gracious to provide us everything we need to live and thrive here on this planet. And also, light travels in a path and can be divided. In fact, this is even stated in Job 38, verse 19 and 24. Long before the scientists analyzed light and the speed of light and what light does and the refraction and so forth. These are amazing things that occur. But even if we lost all of our manuscripts, reason number eight is very crucial. The New Testament is consistent with extra biblical literature. Whenever you open an ancient historical document, whether it be from Rome or from Greece or whatever it might be, you could reconstruct the essential features of the life of Christ. You can see that Jesus lived during the reign of Tiberius, not from the Bible, but look at Roman historical records. You'll find him written there. You also see that he lived a virtuous life. You can look at Roman historical records by Josephus. He was hired by the Roman government to write history. He was a wonder worker, Josephus tells us in his histories. He had a brother named James, according to Josephus. Jesus was acclaimed to be the Messiah, according to Josephus as well, who worked for the Roman government. He was crucified under Pontius Pilate. You find that through Tacitus, who's a Roman historian who writes for the government for their official records. He was crucified on the eve of Passover. This comes from the Jewish Talmud, 
The Jewish literature even says that Christ was hung on a tree on the eve of Passover. Darkness and an earthquake occurred when Jesus died. You can look at Julius Africanus or Thallus to see how they write about this crucial event at the time of the crucifixion. The disciples believed he rose from the dead. Notice that's a crucial point because you don't believe that somebody rose from the dead unless they actually rose and they showed them himself alive. Acts says for 40 days he showed himself by many infallible proofs. And that's exactly what he did to give these people who were hiding for fear of the Jews that they were going to be persecuted next, now to come out and to boldly and courageously proclaim the gospel. How do you get Jews to not eat pork on this weekend and then start eating pork on the next weekend? Something radical must have happened to get them to do that. And the resurrection accounts for that radical change. Notice the disciples were willing to die for their belief. Nobody dies for what they know to be a lie. If they fabricated this story, if Jesus really didn't rise from the dead, people usually say, okay, let me tell you how we did it. Don't kill me. You know, here's the scheme. But no, not one of them. They all died some horrible deaths, and they never recanted. We don't have a record of anybody recanting. and said they, Instead, the disciples of the disciples, like Polycarp says, bring it on. This is the message that we believe because it's rooted in reality. It's not rooted in theory. Notice the gospel spread to Rome, and Jesus was worshipped as a god according to Pliny the Younger and also according to Tacitus, the Roman historian. We know the gospel started in Judea, went to Samaria, and then to the uttermost parts of the world. But we can reconstruct this through extra-biblical literature. And notice reason number nine as we wrap up, nine and ten. Archaeology confirms the biblical history, even though only 1% of the sites in the Middle East have been excavated. Only 1%. Only one of 100 sites have been excavated. But notice the thousands of discoveries to date According to the Antiquities Department database in Israel, the IAA, 30 persons in the New Testament have been confirmed to be real people. 60 persons in the Old Testament were confirmed to be real individuals. 60 confirmed details about the Gospel of John itself. And 80 confirmed historical details in the book of Acts. You can see Colin J. Hemmer's book on Acts to confirm these details if you want more information. But archaeology is crossing the bridge between doctrine and reality. It is the bridge that gets you from what's in the sand and what really took place to the believability of the Christian doctrine that we cherish and prize and have for all of us to enjoy and to benefit from. And notice the final reason, number 10. The New Testament doctrines are grounded in history. They're grounded in history in history, as archaeology has demonstrated. Now, the importance of biblical history shouldn't be overlooked. Remember, the historical statements are inseparable from our doctrines. Like, for example, Romans 4.25, it says that Christ was delivered up for our trespasses, delivered up to the cross, and he was raised for our justification. So notice the delivering up is in time, space, world to a real wooden cross. The raising from a real dark tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. Notice justification comes from being raised from the tomb, according to Romans 4. And forgiveness comes from his death on the cross. So unless you keep the two historical statements, you can't keep the two spiritual benefits. So you get rid of the history, you also get rid of the precious doctrine that we cherish. It's inseparable. You see, guys, our doctrine, our faith, grows out of reality. It grows out of real people, time, and places. Notice, secondly, its confirmed history makes spiritual aspects believable. You see, Jesus, in his conversation with Nicodemus in John chapter 3, verse 12, he said, unless you believe me in earthly things, that you can check out and test and put in a test tube and analyze, how will you ever believe me in heavenly things? 
In other words, if you can't believe him in the little stuff that you can see, how can you ever believe him in the things you can't see, such as justification, virtue, honesty, patience, love, grace, mercy, all those things you can't materialize, so to speak. And then finally, notice that history helps clarify, confirm, and illuminate the Bible. And it does. Daniel chapter 5 was a puzzle for many scholars. Belshazzar was never on any of the Babylonian king's lists. Never written. Never statement. Nothing was written until an archaeological excavation unearthed a round cylinder buried in the floorboards of a temple. Pulled that out, they saw Belshazzar's name. And now we know that Belshazzar was the son of Nabonidus. We never knew that before. And the critics were hammering Christians all day long on this. You see, Nabonidus went out on his little expeditions, and then Belshazzar ended up uh, ruling in his stead. So that's why he wasn't named as a king on the official list, because he was a co-regent with his father while his father was away. But ultimately, history tells of God's love for mankind. Remember, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe should not perish but have eternal life. That's God's love in action. God just didn't stay in his distant palace in heaven and say, I love you. No, he came in time and space, lived the life, put his arm around the 12 disciples and said, I love you. And they've been recorded here for our benefit. You can trust that Jesus Christ loves you and he demonstrated it through action, through behavior. And that's what we should do too. Okay. So as we wrap up, consider your faith. Consider, are you trusting in scripture simply because it sounds good or it's an ancient document? Because there are a lot of things that will cover those bases. But are you believing in Scripture because it's true? Because it corresponds to reality? Because it's the word that God gave us and you can trust it and see it as a reliable record of what the disciples wrote? I hope it's the latter. I hope it's the latter. And I'm confident it is. But trust only in Jesus. Amen? Amen. 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 And I know you're hungry. Let's all stand together. We're going to close in prayer, and I'm going to pray for the meal as well. So when you go out, you can just start gobbling down, enjoying yourself to your heart's content, okay? All right. Lord Jesus, we thank you, Father, for your goodness. We ask that you would internalize the Word of God to us. Give us your clear record to our own hearts, to our own minds. Let us all be convinced in our heart and mind that you left us a record, Father, that can't be assailed, that cannot be overthrown, that cannot be prevented from giving out, getting out to the world. So, Lord, we thank you. We praise you for your goodness. Internalize it in our hearts today. And also, Lord, we lift up the food today and the fellowship. Thank you for the hands that prepared it. And thank you, Lord, that we can enjoy each other's fellowship and love on each other through that wonderful gift of food that you've given us, Lord. Lord, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen.